Great. So this uh, webinar today is part of the Start Parent Leadership Development Training. This is the first of our web-based meetings, and um, we'll tell you more about this series as we go on. I did want to take a moment today and really acknowledge and thank our funders for this project and for these webinars. And so the pa the Start Parent Leadership Development Training is funded by the New Jersey Department of Children and Families Division of Family and Community Partnerships under their Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge grant. So again, thank you very much to our partners there. I am Diane Malley, and I'm the Project Director of the Start Project at SPAN, and that's the project that this Parent Leadership Development Training is under. And we have a number of folks helping to run the webinar today. Um, key presenters will be Michelle Tyler and Monique Duchet Wilson. And then also on our webinar today, we have Karen Antone, Tatiana DeGrossa, and Debbie Esposito, who are all assisting. Um, you may hear their voices at times, and if not, you, you can still know that it takes a whole team and a lot of collaborative work to pull one of these off behind the scenes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Diane, for introducing um, the presenters on today's call. But we realize that there's a lot of knowledge out there listening to this webinar. So let's talk for a little bit. Can everyone put a word or phrase? I'm sorry. Didn't move to the next slide. Thank you. OK, so everyone could put a word or a phrase in the chat box about one thing that you know about decision-making groups. So give everyone just a, a couple of minutes to kind of share that, or less than a minute. Just a word or a phrase. And Karen, as those come in, if you could just let us know what you're seeing. So I'll just give an example of a, of a word or a phrase would be committees. They're a part of decision-making groups, having committees. Karen and Tatiana, any feedback from the audience? I don't see any feedback. Unmuted. Yeah, I see, I see a ton of um, feedback from our attendees. Thank you very much. I'm going to read them out loud real quick. I read collaboration, support, options, different backgrounds, speak up, create change, innovative, again, collaboration, and again, collaboration and needs to be leadership. Uh, partners, power as in support, leaders, uh, some of our participants um, say confusing or confused or divided. So we have a very balanced uh, feedback so far. Michelle? Great. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you guys taking the time to share so that you can share your information with others and knowing that you see that that collaboration is so important, but it is work also. So. Um, I just want to, you know, to let you know to help expand your knowledge about decision-making groups, the STAR project will facilitate three additional webinars addressing important components of serving on decision-making groups, plus an additional webinar that will be in Spanish, which is the one that's on September 29th. So you can visit our website, um, which is in the chat box at this time. You can visit our website to register, and um, you can go to that link there for the additional webinars. Okay, so we really want to credit Wisconsin Facets for some of the materials for today. Their website is also in the chat box for your viewing. Wisconsin Facets, the serving, well, the Serving on Groups That Make Decisions, a guide for families, was developed as part of the State Personnel Development Grant from Wisconsin Department of Public instructions under the Office of Special Education Programs. Now, Wisconsin Facets is a statewide nonprofit organization that was founded in 1995 by a small group of parents who had a desire, a strong desire, to help families understand special education laws and systems. So this is just another great example of parents driving change. So through that collaborative effort between statewide agencies, school representatives, and family members, this guidebook was created. So this publication is going to help you identify the purpose of groups that aim to improve the lives of children and also become confident in your role in such a group. This guide is going to introduce you to common processes and tools 
and groups that make and groups that make decisions. It'll also um, help you show your skills as far as how to communicate effectively in a group, represent other families, and bring the voice of the parent and the family to the table. So whether you serve on a group that addresses education or health or safety, it's important that um, that useful information to assist us as we um, do this guide for families. So just an overview of serving on groups. Um, like I said, the publication um, began because of it was it, uh, because of an identified need for families in. I'm sorry. This publication began because of an identified need to support families in serving on groups making decisions. But the information and the structure of the book is intended to support anyone serving on these groups. It's not limited to a certain area as far as it's not limited to Wisconsin and it's not limited to just education. So um, there's something for everyone in this guidebook. It's a great introduction for some, a welcome refresher for others, and a resource for all, including experts and mentors, so everyone can come to the table ready to serve. So I would like to start with as far as what the um, different reasons why we're here today and what, re what do we represent. So if you can give me just one second, sorry. All right. So by the, t the end of today's webinar, we'll be able to you'll be able to look at how things interest you and your knowledge, and how that's going to help you with benefiting a group. You'll also be able to identify different types of decision making groups and some of the principles that guide decision making groups. And lastly, you'll learn strategies to confidently and actively participate in decision making groups. So I just want to launch a poll uh, as far as why are we all here today? So are we here? Are you attending this webinar as a parent, as a member of a county council for young children, um, as a member of a special education parent advisory group, an educator, or other? So if you guys can take maybe another 30 seconds and click on one of those for me, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, so it seems that 37% of you are here as county council members for young children, and 23% are here as parents, and then we have 14% as educators, 19% as other, and 5% as members of a special education parent advisory group. Okay, I'd like to have Monique continue. Thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us and understanding the importance of family engagement and this webinar today. Uh, family engagement is important, and participation in decision making is key, especially for successful school, family, and community partnerships. Families, families equal partners at the table bringing their voice, their own strengths, and their expertise. It is so important for families to be involved and to be a part of a group, especially if the group's decisions will be affecting the family in one way or another. I mean, think about it. How does it feel when a decision is made for you, about you, and without you? Decision making is an important way for families to be included and heard in the community. Research shows when families are involved in the decision-making process around issues that are important to them, it creates an environment where decisions are more reflective of what the community or families say they need or want and their children have better outcomes. So including families in decision-making activities not only benefits families, but it also benefits the professional. Um, some of the benefits families might experience are an awareness and input and policies. They might have a feeling of ownership 
and shared experiences and connections with professionals and other families due to their inclusion into these groups. Professionals might benefit by gaining an awareness of the family perspective, uh, which may be very different from what they assumed. Uh, there will become an increased trust and confidence in the ability to partner with families. And there becomes an acceptance of family representatives in leadership roles. There becomes a recognition that families don't only bring their own motivation to create change to the table, but their own set of skills and their expertise that make them ready to be equal partners on issues that are meaningful to them. That willingness and readiness to serve is there. So, so you know, you might have some questions. How do we get involved? And you have to think about that all families have made decisions about their child's care, health, and education. So you've already made making decisions that have helped make a difference in your own children's lives. Now you might be thinking about getting involved and choosing to reach out and make a difference for other families and other children. So you might want to ask yourself these questions. How can I get involved? Where do I begin? How can I serve on a group? Next, next, next slide, please. And most of the time, you have to really look within yourself and really think about what do you care about. Families usually get involved in decision-making groups where they see something needs to be improved or changed, but it also has to be really meaningful to them. It has to be something that they are passionate about. So. One of the things that you want to do when you are dreaming is that you want to dream big. And you want your dreams you know, to be huge. You want to think about what is it that you want to change? And also, what type of contributions can you bring? And how can you be involved in this in participating in the decision-making team? What do you hope to accomplish in a year, in five years, in 10 years? And then you start to think about what other dreams are important to you as you begin this journey. This is not just about changing or making an impact within your community or your school. It's also about having a vision of changing and creating some type of personal growth and leadership development within yourself. Great, Monique. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So share so decision, decision making. Decision -making. Okay. Debbie, I'm Debbie, hearing, I'm hearing an an echo. echo. Are you guys hearing that? Hello? I am is hearing Is my sound okay, echo. Debbie? Now you sound better. How is it now? Is, can we proceed? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, so the guidebook is actually built on the concept of shared decision making. And um, Joyce Epstein, who's a researcher in family engagement, has this wonderful quote that sort of sums it up. Decision making means a process of partnering of shared views and actions towards shared goals, not just a power struggle between conflicting ideas. So um, it's really, you know, establishing shared goals, making sure we have multiple perspectives, and that the entire group is coming together for a common focus. Next. And here's some of the guiding principles of shared decision making. And if you download our handouts afterwards, they go into these a little bit more. But um, like with a lot of the county councils and even CPAC groups and other groups you'll be part of, starting with a shared vision where you find some common ground is incredibly important. And we talk a lot often in groups about the representation of really diverse people and making sure we have perspectives of a whole group of people involved in what we're doing. And each of these things is equally important, whether it's equal partners, um, that we're each being treated equally, or the work truly becomes collaborative, um, sharing responsibility to do everything, and sharing information so everybody in the group's on the same page, and everybody working to be accountable for outcomes. So if any of these principles are missing, the 
process of shared leadership, shared decision making is really compromised. Next, so you might want to think about with your own groups, do you, you know, which of these principles are you best at and which ones do you maybe need to work at strengthening? So we also believe that parents are key partners in shared leadership and um, that parents may need some support. So they may need access to translators, interpreters, visual enhancements, training on technology to really be partners. But it's also important to meet people where they are on the issues. So you're not necessarily going to ask people to become concerned about the quality of air nationally, but maybe people would be really concerned about the quality of air they're breathing in their neighborhood. Next. Um, and with shared leadership, the really important thing is that we have lots of people at the table addressing the issues. And I think often we start with really good intentions around this, but an important thing is to keep on asking who else needs to be at the table. So um, it's not okay to just do it once and then get working, but each step of the way as you're working, you need to keep on inviting and keep on bringing essential uh, people to the table to work together. So the, one of the beauties of this is that when we have this working, shared decision making, there becomes more of an ability to really solve complex issues because we need new solutions. And by having various perspectives at the table, that's one of your most valuable tools in finding new solutions. But we also need everybody participating at the table. So it's often good to um, have a discussion on what participation looks and feels like. So you don't want to have invited people and then not have them participating. Next. So um, we think that it takes a really strong commitment to be successful working this way. We need to really acknowledge and honor all perspectives without judgment. So um, all opinions need to be listened to, considered, discussed, and equally valued. It also may make some people uncomfortable at first. This may be a new way of working where ideas get challenged, but hopefully we're challenging ideas and not people. Next. So um, also shared leadership um, can really translate complex challenges into ways that individuals can contribute. So again, we want to ha develop processes for our groups where there's participation by everyone who's um, attending, everyone who's at the table. And that participation really needs to go through developing plans, through the active engagement um, of each step of anything that you've identified to work on. And one of the really key things about shared leadership is it helps people lead in place. So leadership is something that's shared and is ever evolving. So it's different than the way that many of us traditionally may have thought of it. It's non-hierarchical process. So it's not because of someone's position, role, or title that they become a leader. It's because of someone's knowledge, experience, passion, available time, and energy to work on an issue or a and their willingness to attempt something new, maybe. So, you know, who, who facilitates or who leads can ever be changing and involving, and it can involve a broad base of people in this process. Okay, and thanks. I think, yes, next is Michelle is going to talk about who can serve on groups. Yes, thanks so much, Diane. So, you know, the answer to the question of who can serve on groups, well, the short answer is anyone. It's very important for families, though, to be part of a group. Like Monique said earlier, especially if the group's decisions are going to affect the families in one way or another. As you probably know, there are many opportunities to serve on a group, at your child's school, your church, in your community, etc. And your time is valuable. So you want to find a group that's meaningful to you. So to make your time more productive, Carefully consider your options before you consider, before you agree to serving on a group. Consider the amount of time that you have available and the energy that it takes to fulfill your responsibility and role of that group. So that kind of leads us into our next poll. 
So I just would like to ask everyone, what do you spend most of your hours on in a week? So you can just, you know, click on the one of the answers, taking time for yourself, sleeping or dining out with friends, um, working your job, um, caring for your home, like shopping, cooking, etc., spending time with loved ones, and also volunteering in the community or in a, in a four group. High percentage of working, and you know that's that's not surprising. I, okay, I do see you know some people are just say that they spend a lot of time caring for things in their home, making their home run smoother. Okay, I'll give it like another 10 seconds if anyone else wants to add in their opinion. Okay, so you know, as you see, working a job is usually the biggest one that shows up on most of these polls. And just to share with everyone, this, um, this data was taken from Wisconsin Facets um, from their website showing just how much of our time is divided and pulled in so many different directions. Of course, work took most of our time. Um, and looking at this, I was pleasantly surprised that, you know, people did get a lot of rest, which is good. We need to do that. Um, so sleeping was probably, it was, the, was the one with the second highest percentage. And as you can see, things like time for ourselves, volunteering, and church had a very low percentage. So low, you don't even see the numbers on the pie chart. <laughs> so this chart, um, so as you think about this chart, Think about it when you think about the time and how your time is divided as you decide what group you want to have meaningful participation in. Okay, so where do you begin though? So where does one begin when they um, want to take part in a group that makes decisions? Well, here's is to get you started. You can learn about the resources and services that are available. You can look on the web or at your um, local community center, school, library, or even a state or national organization. Find an issue that you deeply care about. It requires passion on your part to devote the time and energy that you need in order to be part of a group. Um, also, connect with a group with authority to create change. You know, no one wants to go to a meeting just to meet. You know, doing the things, doing um, Doing that is the surest way to make sure that you, that you know that you're making a difference to a greater number of people. And also prepare yourself to serve. This means making sure your time is productive by considering the amount of time that you have available and the energy that it would take to fulfill the responsibilities of your role on the group. Also, we need to continuously prepare ourselves by improving our leadership skills like we're doing today at, during this webinar series. So I just want to take this time, um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, if you have any questions, you can put them in during the time that we're speaking, and we'll have a couple of times during the webinar to open up, um, to, to have someone read the questions that anyone has in the chat or question box. So Karen, are there any questions that you want to talk about? I do not see any questions from anyone at this time. Okay, Tatiana, do you see any in the other area of question or chat? Unmuted. No, I uh, no questions so far. Uh, I our participants um, do have one suggestion though, Michelle. If you could please next time um, after the poll, you share the poll results with the audience. Uh, a lot of our attendees are visual um, learners and would appreciate uh, to see their um, results. Excellent. Thank you. I'm sorry. I thought I did. Thank you so much for saying that. So you see it now, correct? We did, but it came off. There we go. Someone else did it. Okay. All right. I think that so was... Some 
Okay, so if there are no other questions, um, we're going to move to types of groups. Monique? Thank you, Michelle. We talked about how to get started, how to get involved, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of groups that you might have the opportunity to choose from. And usually at first glance, you think a group is a group. But there are many different types of groups that have different functions and who have members that perform a variety of different types of roles. Um, these groups can take on a lot of different forms, uh, from a formal group, like a state advisory committee, providing input and feedback that's related to statewide issues, to an informal group, an event committee, like an event committee uh, for a lo local church. Uh, there may be groups that may just be formed for specific purposes and may be temporary and go away, such as an ad hoc committee. And then there may be standing committees, which are usually permanent, and study issues and reports and advise groups based on their form. Um, there's groups that meet for years and their membership changes over time, as do the roles of the members. Uh, Decision-making groups do important work, no matter what their structure, their issue, or size. And understanding the different types of groups and ensuring that people are prepared to fulfill their role is important because these groups all work a little differently. And the information that we're getting ready to share may help you select a group and prepare you for serving on the group that you choose. Next slide. Does anybody else hear um, feedback? Yes. A I do not. Bit, I'm not sure where it's coming from. Mute everyone else okay. and you can go ahead and continue. Okay. Um, what makes decision-making groups unique? Each decision-making group is unique. Although some may have similarities, many may, be, many may have different variables that really make them different from one another. The way they make decisions, their decision-making authority, may be very different. Their issues that they are working on will be different. Um, the way that they meet, the structure that they choose, can vary from group to group. How they um, gather data, the processes they use, what their history is, the diversity of their perspectives. Again, these are all different things that create unique groups and provide different opportunities for you in regards to what you might be looking for. Next slide. Also, there's different types of member roles. Although groups may differ, um, most all have common roles that groups need in order for the group to be effective. Everyone has a leader, and usually that leader sets the agenda. You may have a facilitator, a facilitator, a facilitator, facilitator. Ugh. Um, you may have a secretary or a note taker. Um, these are all roles that fulfill that people are leading and that they are involved. Um, and you want to find out what type of roles that there are in the type of group that you want to commit yourself to. So I want you need to think, you know, do you see these roles or do you see where, these, where there can be additional roles in any of the groups that you are currently serving on or any groups that you might just be deciding to choose to be a part of. So as I mentioned, there are six unique functions of groups and some groups may serve more than one of these functions. Um, they can look similar but can have very different purposes. So we're going to just take a minute and we're going to look a little bit more closely at each group, what some of their activities are, and possible member roles that can be included within these groups. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is a governing group. So the function of a governing group is usually more formal. Members are usually appointed or elected to a position. And their, person is to, and their purpose is to govern an organization and to set policy. So some of the activities would include establishing bylaws, 
evaluating the executives, and even developing certain policies. So a school board and a city council is um, an example, is a good example of the function of a group that governs. The second group is the advisory group. And this group is usually concerned with a single issue, and the membership is usually composed of individuals who are representative of a broader group of people affected by the same issue and have expertise in this issue. Uh, an advisory group usually serves as a resource. And advisory councils usually provide limit, their authority is usually limited to giving advice or recommendations. Uh, it's very important for people to understand that if you are choosing to be on an advisory group, you may give recommendations, but that does not mean that your right that the uh, that your group is obligated to follow that advice. Um, some roles of members that can sit on an advisory group may be a chairperson. Um, they can be a representative that's providing the family perspective on that group. And some examples can be a special education advisory group or a CPAG or a focus group. Okay, so when we look at a leadership group, in a leadership group, membership can include any combination of family members, youth, community members, policymakers, and professionals. They also have a specific role and responsibilities, but the leadership team can vary from school to school or even district to district. So now, a leadership team is typically a group of administrators, teachers, and other staff members who lead and coordinate school improvement activities. But other participants may volunteer to be part of the team, or they can even be recruited by administrators. So in recent decades, for an example, leadership teams have evolved into a form of shared leadership, like RTI, or Response to Intervention Team. The team looks at the data and then creates a plan to implement strategies for addressing the identified need. And then they meet on a regular basis to monitor the progress and make any other suggestions. The fourth group is the planning group. And planning groups deal with a specific issue, and their job is to plan and carry out an activity usually designated by a more formal group. So some of the things that they do is that they may develop and select a cur curriculum. They may assess needs and develop priorities. And it's interesting, what's really important to remember is that sometimes there are laws that require families to be involved on groups that are planning or evaluating services for a specific child or a group of children. It's really important to know if you're looking for that type of group, where by law there's an obligation for parents to be a part of it. And some examples can be um, work groups within your school, within your community. It can also be your individual educational IEP team. Okay, and another group Another function of a group that we want to talk about today is evaluation. The group evaluates the work by others by measuring the, the work of large organizations or publicly funded agencies or even large projects. So other tasks also include evaluating the work of others, collecting data to make recommendations, and then they create a plan and share the results and monitor for progress. So for example, the school district implemented a new high school class schedule one year ago. So the school board appointed a group of people to evaluate and implement um, the implementation of the new schedule. So that group would have been made up of administrators, school staff, parents, students, those who are involved and would be affected by that change. And some of the activities that that high school schedule review group would, would do would be maybe survey the teachers, the parents, and the students. Maybe even conduct a focus group to review the data and, um, and the overall student achievement. And then at the end of that time, they would then analyze the results. 
So they would compile a report and present their findings to a school board for their information and use that to consider if there's a reason to change or modify how the school schedule is going. And the last group is a practice group. Everyone in a practice group is considered to be an expert because of personal or professional experiences. Even the families that are involved have experience interacting with service systems and professionals. Uh, this group provides a structure for communication and learning and action. They come together and they gather stakeholders' input at all levels and really discuss emerging or systemic issues and find common interests to find resolve. Uh, some examples of practice groups can be a learning circle or a community of practice. Okay, so now that we've shared different examples and different types of functions of groups, let's review, not really review, but let's go over and see how much was understood, and then afterwards we can go to questions. So a special education parent advisory group is an example of what type of group? So I just want, do you guys see the poll? Okay, great. I see people voting. Great. <laughs> you can just, you know, let me know what you think that answer is. All right, at this point, about 30% of you have voted. I'll give it another 30 seconds or so. Okay, um, what's interesting is that the answer is advisory group, and 90% of you said that. But I will say that planning group and leadership group, you know, every group does it specifically identified as that's their only function. So there are different things that go on in a special education parent advisory group other than just the advisory piece. So I'm glad that other people picked those other two answers because it's important to realize that it's not specific to just one function, but the main function of a special education parent advisory group is as an advisory group. All right, let's try another one. So your local school board is an example of an advisory group, a planning group, a governing group, or a leadership group. All right, about 40% of you have voted so far, so we're going to close it out in another 10 seconds or so. Thanks so much for participating in the poll. And 71% of you say a governing group, and that is true. The, the main function of your local school board would be as a governing group. Okay, and I just have one more poll question to share, and that is, which one of these groups would be an example of a planning group? So would it be a focus group, a membership committee, a task force for global health, a school board, or a county council for young children? This one's a little harder because I see that people are voting all over. We're at about 40%. If we can give it like another 10 seconds before I close the poll. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And the answer for this one would be a membership committee. So a membership committee would be an example of a planning group. The next, I think the highest um, response was a county council, a county council for young children. So th that even though they do planning, I think their group would be considered, if I'm not mistaken, more of an, an more of an advisory group, but it wouldn't be a planning group. It would be more so the membership committee. 
Okay. All right, so once again, if anyone has any questions, if you can put them in the chat box and we can read them off for any of the presenters today. Or if you'd like, you can raise your hand and be unmuted to ask a question. We have a question from Elizabeth. Uh, and her question is, this training is for CY, uh, CCYC, which is a group with authority to create influence and change. Why should parents select the county youth councils over other groups? Diane, would you like to answer that? Oh, great. Terrific. Thank you for unmuting me. So um, I wanted to say that I think the, the type of group, you know, we went through that defini de those definitions so people have some sense and think about that as you join groups. But CCYCs, the County Councils for Young Children, probably fall into multiple categories there. And um, they are definitely more than just advisory groups because they may have committees who's uh, goal is to take action on things, and that would be different than just advising. So I think one of the um, interesting things about the County Councils for Young Children in New Jersey now is that they were created because of the importance of focusing, focusing on this period of time from even before people have a child to eight years old, because we now know that that lays the groundwork for so many important things throughout the child's life. So it's a really crucial time to um, make sure that we get it right. And the county councils are in such a good position to affect change here, because they're really, all of them, are working to have a really broad base of stakeholders um, who can really address very complex issues and I think come up with some innovative solutions. The other reason I think people should connect there is even if you're part of another type of group, you may have cross um, interest in issues. So if you're part of your special education parent advisory group, for instance, you may want to connect with your county council for young children and see what they're doing around issues of education. And so I think people will get much more traction on issues if we can at least you know, get connected to our county council for young children in, in the county where you live and see what priorities they've identified and if any of those cross over to what your interests and interests may be work in terms of what you want to work on. Karen, do we have anything else at this point? You, so Diana. I'll repeat. Um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. Okay, we, we do have two more questions, but you can go ahead Great. and finish. No, go ahead. I was just going to remind okay. people, if you want to raise your hand and have your line unmuted, um, you'll see on your screen, it's in your control panel in your right-hand side, and there's a little hand. I think you just press it, and then we will do our best to see if we can unmute you. Okay, I have a question from Deirdre, who uh, has a group of nine people listening in today. She would like to know what would be the main group category of the task force on global health. Task force on global health. Is that the question that you just did, Michelle? That was one, one of the that was one of the choices from mm -hmm. the question. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was not. So, what um, category would that we was, put that in? What does Deirdre uh, think? Yeah, task force for global health. I don't. I would say probably leadership or practice. So if it's mm -hmm. a task force, it's probably going to want to take action on something, and um, you know it's not involved in evaluation. It's not governing. They may do some planning, but that may not be the primary function of it. But they're certainly. Um, a practice group in that they're working around something and they're definitely taking leadership on things too. So I would say that they would be some of the key um, key types that they might fall under. Okay. Yes, Thanks, I dear. Yeah, Do you have... I said before, it, a lot of the groups will have more than one function. So that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and this is not hard and fast. It's not a science. It's a way to think about, 
you know, groups, particularly as you're getting involved, you know, to think about what sort of um, authority does this group have, what really is this group's focus, and does it match with what my dreams are? You know, will I really be able to make the impact that I'm hoping to make in the type of group that it is? Okay, um, we have another question. Actually, two people ask questions about PTAs and PTOs. Kevin and Anna would like to know um, what type of a group is a PTA or PTO, and also how do they function? They would like to discuss how we how they function. They're great questions. So um, I think how PTAs and PTOs function can differ somewhat locally, you know, in each area. And, um, you know, one thing that many of us may not know about PTOs and PTAs is that they have a really strong um, component around advocacy. And we just don't see that embraced a lot of places. So that's sort of really interesting. So they are definitely... Um, I would say they're they're really sort of a leadership group. They're trying to lead in their schools. They're trying to lead around issues around education. And then they may actually do some of these other things as part of their work. They may advise on things. They may plan a lot of things. Um, anybody else want to jump in on that, Michelle or anyone? I agree with you, Diane. I think that uh, the function of a PTA can differ widely depending on the school district and how, um, and even sometimes depending on the principal in a specific school as to how the, the school district or the school and the PTO have agreed to work together. Right. Right, but I think what people may oftentimes don't know is that they really do have a strong advocacy history, um, and and they have had that function, you know, historically. And another thing a lot of people don't know about PTOs and PTAs is that they they have a, a strong national component. I mean, they're a national organization, and so the potential um, to operate as an advocate, as advocates, and as lobbyists. Um, are, is is there and like you say, I think it's unfortunate that we as parents and PTO members embrace that function as much as we could. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I didn't mm -hmm. realize that I was muted. Um, yeah, it is so important that we realize that they're not just planning groups, and even when we look at special education parent advisory groups, sometimes the groups, the A part of the group, is taken out as far as advisory, and it winds up being a planning group or, you know, doing other functions other than advising back to the school district as to different policies. So, and then I think part of that comes from the fact that PTAs and PTOs have always had that sort of, you know, bake sale, fundraiser kind of activities that they've done. So groups are really changing as far as that, and parent involvement is really what helps to drive that change so that we're part of that shared decision making and we're having um, when we're putting meaningful information and meaningful involvement in the group. That's right. And um, the PTA ultimately is really intended to facilitate parental participation in, in a school. So, um, and that's not limited to uh, social activities. That really should and can have a component around decision making as well. Great, great questions. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, one more question, and we um, Elizabeth would like to know if they're going to receive the PowerPoint for this session afterwards. Uh, yes, so um, I believe that um, if you look on in your control panel, there are handouts for today, and we the PowerPoint is one of the handouts. So um, on your right-hand side, again, is your control panel, and one of those panes is handouts, and there are five handouts for today. So you have section one of the guidebook, opportunities to get involved, section two of the guidebook, types of groups. You have the PowerPoint for the, um, the sections that we covered today. And you also have the guidebook resource list for this sec section one and two. 
And we have um, the six types of involvement, which is a framework for family engagement by Joyce Epstein. So when you, we couldn't go into detail on that today, but again, when you look at that, decision making and parents being part of that is one of the six types of involvement that um, Epstein and the PTA has adopted that frame, a framework very similar to that of ways that parents can be involved. So thanks, Elizabeth, definitely. Okay. We were going to point that out. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Is, this is a, from Kevin. Is it correct to say it is important to determine or confirm what your group authority is and what the deliverables, deliverables will be? Oh, my goodness. Kevin, <laughs> absolutely. You sound like maybe you have some experience where, you know, that became a challenge. So I think oftentimes when we don't confirm exactly what those things are, like the authority of the group and what the deliverables or really what your priorities are and what your um, goals are. And people get very, very frustrated and often drop, drop off in their participation very early on. So the more that groups can define upfront and in transparent ways, um, what the group's functions are, what authority the group has as a whole, and what positions are in terms of that shared leadership within the group, um, the better that group will function, and then the more capable that group will be of the identifying priorities, creating the real steps to make some change, and having the outcomes, or as Kevin puts, the deliverables that they want. So the more we take the time to do this work up front and define these things, the stronger the group usually is. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, so why don't we go to the next couple slides right now. If we have more time at the end, we can always go back to a couple more questions. So continue to put them in, and if we have time, we certainly will attempt to answer them. So um, again, I, did, um, I just pointed out where you can download all the resources from today. And um, also, you want, may want to make note that the Serving on Groups, they do have a whole website with resources around these materials, including a spot, and this is from Wisconsin, this is not our work, but out of Wisconsin, where you can watch modulars of each of the sections of the guidebook. Um, and these are just a couple of our websites that you might want to take note of and be connected to us through the START Project. That's where you can register for the rest of the webinars for the County Council for Young Children Parent Leadership Development Training Team. We have a lot of things going on there. And then SPAN is also a great spot to go for any resources you may need. And if you need individual assistance on any issues as a parent, um, navigating any systems that you may be involved in, please call our warm line. And they do an intake and then um, a trained um, employed staff person who is a parent will return your call. Next one. So um, I, we do want to point out that this is the first in this webinar series. So this is really sort of the introduction. And we're going to get in a lot deeper into this curriculum as we go on. In the August um, training, we're going to review a lot of the processes groups use, like including um, whether you use consensus decision making, Robert's Rules of Orders, how to run meetings, and a bunch of the tools that groups often use. And then on September 8th, we're going to dive deep into the section on data. And as we said, on September 29th, we're going to do an overview of this curriculum in Spanish. So the whole webinar will be run in Spanish. And then we'll finish this series on October 13th with really talking about what are the roles for families as they serve on groups and what are some skills that you really may want to develop or um, contribute in these groups. Next slide. And I think, unless I forgot anything else, which my team could jump in with me on, we want to really thank everybody for joining us today. We'll remind you again to um, go to our upcoming events page. You will need to register for each of these webinars. Doing it once is only for that individual webinar. So you have to go in and do each webinar. And again, we really um, want to thank and acknowledge our partners at the Department of Children and Families who are working really hard to um, make strong county councils for young children throughout New Jersey. And if we can be of any assistance, 
assistance to any of the groups that you're starting, that you're working on, or you have other questions um, around developing parent leadership, please feel free to reach out to me and I can also um, connect you with any of our staff who would be appropriate. So to my staff, am I forgetting anything else before we wrap it up for Diane, today? Or do we, we, have a, we have a hand raised by Melba. Uh, sure. I'm going to unmute her. Melba, are you there? Melba, I guess I, she no longer has a question. Okay, all right, no problem. Do we have any other questions we can handle in the last minute or so, or are we good? Um, there is a question regarding um, the, the four webinars. This is the four webinars in English. Will all the material from the four webinars be included in the Spanish webinar? So we're doing an overview of the whole curriculum, so there's no way we can do the whole thing, you know, what we cover in four hours in one hour. So um, our bilingual specialists and um, Brenda Figueroa and a couple other folks are reviewing that material and we're going to really try to do, you know, the highlight of that and then from there we can, you know, I think there's other things being developed that will probably be presented later on even outside of this project. But to start, it will be a one hour overview. And Diane, you might Great want to question. mention the evaluation. Oh, thank you, thank you. I knew I was forgetting something. So it is 1 o'clock. As you um, close out this webinar today, we want to thank you so much for joining us. And there will be a very short um, survey that will pop up hopefully on your screen as you close out. We certainly would appreciate you completing that. And there will also be a follow-up email where a link to that will come as well. And we will be sending you um, the link to the recording and um, I possibly the a link to the recording in the next day or so. So again, thank you to my team, thank you to our partners at the Department of Children and Families, and especially thank you to everybody who joined and stayed with us today. So with that, we'll end the webinar.